Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Marav Fine from the Jewish Funders Network, and I'm really glad that you guys can all be on the phone with us today um, and, on, and on the web with us today. We're here with Michael Hirschhorn, Chava Sherrington, Leo Ferguson, and Dove Kent to talk about Jews of color and the Jewish community. This call is intended for folks who are interested in the Jewish community broadly and inclusion in the Jewish community, moving forward, um, where Jews of color are, um, how funders can better engage with Jews of color as, we, as we're moving forward um, with, the, with their agenda. We'll be hearing from Chava, who's the president of the Jewish Multiracial Network, and she can really give more meat to that, um, as well as Leo and Dove from uh, JFRED. This will be moderated by Michael Hirschhorn, the president of the Jacob and Hilda Blastein Foundation, a JFN member. Um, he's a nonprofit strategy consultant with a background in the fields of education, human rights, and leadership development. He is a JFN member, has been involved for years with us, and is really interested in this work um, and supports this work and really needs no introduction. Um, and just a moment to talk about JFN as well. Our mission is to work with Jewish funders on the individual and collective levels to increase the power of the network. Um, we believe that funders funding together um, is the essence of what Jewish communal giving is about, and we're committed to helping funders to understand more about the Jewish community, more about the broader funding community so that they can affect greater change. Um, and so this call is, is a part of that. All of our webinars and programs are related to one of our values. Um, we believe that really all of our values are important in every program. I'd say this one is especially related to Elu Ve'elu inclusion. Um, we're a plural, pluralistic organization. We're a pluralistic community, and um, that's what this call is really all about. So uh, without further ado, uh, Michael, take it away. Um, hey, thanks, Marav, and hi, everybody. Uh, I jumped at the chance when I was invited to moderate this call. Um, it's it uh, comes very much from the heart, it really, for me, uh, for the Jacob and Hilda Blaustein Foundation. We're a family foundation, about 55 years old. Uh, it's based in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, my family and I live here in Brooklyn, New York. Um, we uh, support organizations like the ones we'll hear from today, the Jewish Multiracial Network, Jews for Racial and Economic Justice, a third organization, Bend the Ark, that helped to support uh, um, convening you'll, you'll hear about. Um, for me, uh, this runs about as deep as it goes at a, at a values level, at a political level, at a personal level, um, in the broadest of senses. If we as uh, Jews, as Marav just said about JMN, uh, if we feel we're uh, worshiping metaphorically together as a community, then we have to be all completely welcome and worshiping together the full breadth of the community. This is the only honest reflection of who uh, Jews are in the 21st century. Um, we're no longer a monolithic uh, community. Uh, politically, um, I think I believe, and our foundation values believe strongly that um, in, in, an, in, a, in an approach, a philosophy that if you're organizing around an issue, start first with your own and build out from there. And um, issues surrounding Jews of color, it's one of the most powerful, authentic. It's, it's links to the movements, to the, um, uh, to the um, this phase, this powerful current phase of movements for racial justice nationwide around the world. And um, personally, um, I'm married to Jimena Martinez, born in Colombia. We're raising our family uh, as a Jewish family. Um, we uh, are in our in our marriage, in our kids' bar and bat mitzvahs. Uh, they're twins in the last year, navigating a road around a more multicultural um, and diverse Jewish community has been um, often uh, incredibly meaningful, sometimes challenging, and um, it's it's an effort to, um, I think, m our involvement, my, my um, our foundation's involvement is really an effort to see, to look for others to continue to support the kind of work. Um, we're, we're joined today by three incredible speakers. Uh, you'll hear for yourselves, 
Hava Shervington is the president of the board of the Jewish Multiracial Network. You'll hear she's passionate. She's a, a committed div, uh, advocate for Jewish diversity. Uh, Hava is a regular speaker on and writer on Jewish diversity issues. She's appeared in the Chicago Tribune, uh, the Jewish Telegraphic Agency, uh, the Salon. Um, she was selected as one of Jewish Week's 36 under 36 and recently founded a law firm um, of her same name. Uh, uh, Leo Ferguson and uh, Dove Kent, uh, the other two speakers, both work for uh, Jews for Racial and Economic Justice. Uh, Leo Ferguson is the community and communications organizer at JFREDGE. Uh, he has led JFREDGE's transformative Jews of Color organizing for the last several years, um, helping to build and support a growing community of Jews of Color leading the wider Jewish community in racial justice organizing. Um, he also leads uh, closely related Jay Fred's campaign on police accountability, and the um, and uh, what Jay Fred calls you'll hear about shortly the Grace Paley Organizing Fellowship. Um, Dove Kent is the executive director of Jews for Racial and Economic Justice. Um, she has uh, years of experience in uh, organizing in affordable housing, police accountability, civil rights, restorative justice, worker rights, immigrant rights. Um, uh, Dove teaches around the country at the intersection of anti-Semitism and racism, historical trauma, the role of Jews and movements for justice. And um, let me turn it over to uh, Hava, our first speaker. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I, as Michael said, this is um, an issue that's very dear to me. It's incredibly personal. Um, as a Jew of color, as um, someone in community with a lot of other Jews of color, um, as someone raising um, Jews of color. Um, the issue of inclusion and acceptance of Jews of color and prioritization of Jews of color in the um, larger Jewish community is one that I've been working passionately on for um, years and in a variety of formats. And uh, most recently, um, leading the Jewish Multiracial Network, um, which is an organization that's been around for um, almost 20 years at this point working on these issues. And I think it's really important that um, we start to think you know, broadly as a community, particularly funders, as um, why this community, um, why we should prioritize or uh, focus on this community. Um, I think it's a community that hasn't historically um, had a lot of attention um, by a lot of uh, Jewish institutional uh, groups, whether they be funders or organizations. Um, and I think that that's something that for, um, that, that, ne that really needs to, to change, um, particularly uh, just to acknowledge the changing reality of who the Jewish community is. Um, Jews of color have already, always existed. Um, it's a constituency that um, maybe has not been um, very public or present in uh, you know, the American Jewish community, but um, you know, there have been Jews in the Caribbean, Latin America, Asia um, for centuries. Um, but I think that technology becoming a more global society has started to inform us not only of that diverse history and cultural heritage, but the fact that we're a rapidly changing um, Jewish community. Um, if you look at the at various demographic studies um, that are analyzing you know, who the Jewish community is um, in the 21st century, we're, we're really starting to see a big change. Um, a 2011 population study uh, that the New York Federation did found that 12% of Jewish households in the New York City metro area um, included a person of color. Um, that's huge. That means that 12% of Jewish households in the New York City metro area are multiracial. Um, and that number is steadily increasing. Um, an example of that shift in what it means um, as we move into the, further into the 21st century. Um, a 2007 uh, Boulder Jewish study found that 9% um, of local Jewish households are multiracial, 
with another 3% identifying as Hispanic. So that's, you know, a 12% um, of Jewish households in that area um, identifying um, as diverse uh, Jews in some way. And then for households headed by someone 39 years of age or older, 16% um, of households are multiracial. So that means that if you're, you know, doing a quick analysis, for folks um, 40 and under, um, that's almost, you know, that's almost double. Um, so we're looking at a rapid shift. We're looking at a, what could be a huge demographic shift within the Jewish community. And we as uh, Jewish leaders, funders, institutions need to be ready to address that. Um, and we need to be thinking about what that means, with what programming are we offering as a community, what support systems are we offering as a community, what resources are we offering as a community, and are they going to be relevant to the Jewish community um, that is going to exist in 10 years? Um, are they going to be, are the Jewish Hebrew school books going to be relevant to the Jewish Hebrew school students um, in the next 10 to 15 years? Will they see a classroom um, in those images that looks like the classroom that they're in? Um, are they going to see pictures on their synagogue that looks like the folks who are sitting in the pews? Um, we really have to, I think, think broadly about um, how that's going to affect the way that we engage ourselves as a Jewish community. And further, just acknowledging that diversity allows us to engage our own community's narrative and our community um, in a really more authentic and, and nuanced way. I think a lot of us talk about um, how do we get millennials engaged, how do we keep um, folks who are generation X, Y, whatever they're called these days, um, to be committed to Jewish community. And I think part of that is providing them with tools, resources, um, programming that is relevant to their lives. And if they don't see Jewish books that look like their family, if they don't see um, posters or um, films that look like or, or are their experience, um, are they going to relate? Are they going to be interested in that? And I think that that's um, something that's really important um, for us to think about as we engage um, just the Jewish community in general. Um, so where does that, where, where does that leave us? Um, so currently, there are very few organizations that are specifically addressing um, the inclusion of racially and ethnically diverse Jews and their family into the larger Jewish community. Um, most of these organizations are um, relatively small. There might be a lot of work done by um, individuals in certain areas. Um, these organizations, particularly those led by Jews of color, um, tend to be unstaffed or volunteer run or very minimally staffed and under-resourced. Um, a large part of this is um, due to a variety of reasons. Um, one is that a lot of it starts from grassroots. A lot of it um, starts outside of uh, larger institutions. Um, it starts from individuals, particularly who see issues in their community. They see that um, kids are having problems in Hebrew schools, that the, the synagogue they're in does not reflect them or their culture, um, that they are um, isolated when they enter Jewish events or attempt to become Jewish professionals. So they start uh, working on their own. And because they're working outside of the system, they don't necessarily have um, the connections and network that, um, that others do um, who are engaged in, in, in work inside the Jewish community. So what does that mean for how they do their work? Um, a lot of folks have heard of some organizations, um, are kind of becoming aware of some of the work these organizations are doing, 
um, which is fantastic, particularly given the level of resources that they have. Um, a lot of this is by maximizing technology and leveraging technology, particularly social media. I know for us, um, the Jewish Multiracial Network, which is um, an unstaffed organization, we're completely volunteer run. Um, we have thousands of, of uh, folks that we engage regularly um, through social media. Um, we, that's how we make folks aware of our events, aware of the uh, writing that we're doing, aware of when we're featured or, or of um, any books uh, or any other resources that would be of interest particularly to our community. This is how we're engaging them. It's something that's been really helpful particularly for folks um, across the spectrum. Um, it helps us reach people who are in, um, let's say, geographic areas that aren't um, uh, that are smaller Jewish communities, folks in the Midwest, folks in the South, um, and by uh, leveraging and utilizing skills of our members, people who are lawyers in other lives, uh, people who are grant writers, people who are uh, PR folks, those folks were utilizing their skill sets. Um, we're building relationships and, and uh, developing strategic partners with other larger uh, Jewish institutions who have kind of more funding and resources um, to leverage their, uh, um, their resources for uh, greater engagement in the work that we're doing. Um, most of the current work that's being done can be broken down into a couple subsections. Um, speaking, engagement in, speaking engagements and presentations on issues of Jewish diversity. A large part of what we do is educating folks on issues um, that Jews of color face uh, when engaging in Jewish communal spaces. Um, we do a lot of programming for Jews of color and multiracial Jewish families, um, whether it be retreats, camps, holiday and social programming. I think this is a really critical component of the work that we do. A lot of folks are becoming less involved because of their interaction with larger community spaces because they aren't yet inclusive. And so a lot of the work that we do is keeping folks engaged and identifying as Jewish. Resource development, we develop original materials, whether it be posters, calendars, books, film, um, that um, feature Jews of color. I think that um, it's time for us to acknowledges Jewish community, our diversity, and so our materials and the way that we talk and envision ourselves need to reflect that. So part of the work that we do is creating those resources. Uh, developing toolkits for conversations on race and Jewish communal life. So for example, um, something that we will be releasing soon is a guide to how to discuss race with youth <coughs> that's grounded in Jewish text and tradition, and that's something that um, will be a tool for Jewish parents and for Jewish educators. So um, a way to talk about privilege within the context um, We advise organizations on best practices for inclusion of Jews of color and multiracial Jewish families. A lot of the work we do is uh, contacted now by people who realize that this is an issue. Um, and they say, well, what can we do to make people feel included and involved? Um, and we work with organizations on that resource compilation. A lot of material, there are materials out there that exist. A lot of folks don't know how to find them. So part of what we do is compile these resources and provide them um, with lists and when we can, um, links to how to purchase them um, on our website and social media, as well as do original writing, whether it's op-eds or um, blog posts on these issues for a variety of different um, sources. And then leadership development. A lot of Jews of color who are currently working as Jewish professionals in other organizations have gained entree into Jewish professional life through uh, working with uh, Jewish diversity organizations. They are places where they first gain entree into working in Jewish communal organizations and institutions and learning how they work, and then also start to network with uh, larger Jewish professional organizations. Um, something that they may not have the opportunity to do um, through traditional means. So that's been a, a great route for Jews of color 
who are looking to get more involved in Jewish professional life. So uh, the Jewish color convening. Um, one of the key reasons that we were interested in doing the convening um, was not necessarily to highlight and kind of what we're doing um, currently, which you know was great as people wanted to discuss that, but really highlighting um, the need for Jewish institutions, Jewish funders, um, to invest into work that, that's being done, work that's on the horizon, why we think it needs to be a priority, and highlight that there are folks from all over the country. This isn't a small community in New York. It's not a small community in LA. It's a, it's a pluralistic community. We had folks who are secular identifying as Jewish to people who are Orthodox um, attend. And it's a pluralistic community, it's a wide-ranging community, it's a larger community than you think it is, and we gathered 140-odd folks, um, but had much more interest, um, who were interested in being change makers um, on these issues. And I think that that was important to recognize and important for folks to see. Um, it was also about changing the conversation. Um, a lot of the work that's been done to date focuses on kind of the exoticism of Jews of color. It's um, let's tell this wonderful, strange story of this person who happens to be a person of color and Jewish, and how did that come to be? Um, and moving that from that um, kind of more superficial conversation to a conversation on structures and models, and what, are, what can we do um, on an institutional level um, and on a larger scale to make Jews of color feel like an integral and completely authentic part of Jewish communal and organizational life. Um, how can we move from focusing on, on narrative to building communities that are inclusive? Um, and then gaining consensus. Because a lot of these organizations are small, maybe even one-man shops, there are people who um, or regional leaders um, organically gathering um, folks. What what are we working on? Can we can we not um, can our efforts not be redundant? Um, are there specific ways where we can cooperate um, together and and utilize our collective strength uh, to move certain issues forward? And identifying and understanding consistent challenges uh, that people face uh, when they're um, when they're moving forward um, as they're trying to accomplish their objectives. And a consistent concern that was raised was lack of investment, which is why I was really excited that we're having this conversation, is that folks are interpreting lack of investment as lack of prioritization, as well as lack of interest in them remaining a part of the Jewish community and Jewish communal life. And I don't think that that message is intentional, but I think that that message is what's being received. And I think it's important, you know, for us to kind of acknowledge that and then see where, where, we, can, where we can go from here. Um, where are ways um, that folks can invest wisely and effectively in the leadership of Jews of color and in programming um, related to Jews of color um, that is going to facilitate real change. And um, we're starting to see some great progress. I, I will say that um, from when I started doing this work to now, I've definitely seen an increase in attention from funders on Jews of color. Um, there is a Sela Jew of color cohort, which was fantastic. Um, certain micro grants, um, there's been development of uh, series and programming on Jews of color um, in JCCs and federations and um, other isolated uh, subgroups on diversity with, within Judaism. Um, but I think that the way that that's, that's currently being done could uh, be modified to be a lot more effective. And one is support, directly supporting Jewish leaders of color. Um, Part of the a key issue is that Jews of color are, um, you know, a lot of them are doing this um, through because of passion and love, and they're maintaining, you know, full-time or part-time 
jobs um, to make ends meet. So supporting operational costs and budgets of people who are doing this work, have been doing this work. Um, increasing uh, support of professional training for folks in this, uh, who are doing this work. And so that folks can kind of gain access to rooms um, and folks that they, sh they could possibly uh, be networking with. Um, maybe sponsor a couple of scholarships to conferences and networking events so that they can um, introduce the work that they're doing to um, larger uh, Jewish institutional settings. Um, bring the constituency to the table. Um, I think that there has been some great uh, efforts, but I think um, part of the issue with some of the funding that's being currently done is that Jews of color have not been included in the process. And so part of the microgrants are maybe targeting things that are either superficial in nature or are targeting folks who don't have any experience in this work or um, are in maybe areas of less prioritization if you ask Jews of color and multiracial Jewish families um, the things that they need. So I think that uh, centralizing Jews of color um, when you're thinking of um, investing in this area um, would be really helpful in uh, maximizing your return on your investment dollars as to kind of what people are actually looking for. And then being willing to step out of your comfort zone, acknowledging that a lot of people doing this work um, might not be your traditional um, partner organizations that you fund. Um, your traditional partner organizations might not have experience in this work. They might be institutions that historically Jews of color have shied away from due to previous experiences in them. So they might not be the best vehicles for this work. So really kind of understanding the culture of, of this community and then considering startups and new innovators um, when you're looking for investment. And then um, the last thing I'll say is uh, really looking beyond diversity giving. I think a lot of um, times when people think of uh, Jews of color, it's what well, we want to do specific um, diversity funding. So um, let's look for a specific project or program um, to uh, fund at this point. But maybe thinking if we're going to do educational um, uh, if we're funding general education or we're funding Hebrew school education resources, are there Jews of color or there Jews of color organizations who are doing work in this area um, that might be um, an opportunity for funding as well? So just to, to consider investing in Jews of color and Jews of color organizations as part of a larger funding strategy um, rather than just in um, a specific targeting um, investment in Jewish diversity. So with that, I think I ran a little bit over. Um, so I will uh, pass the mic to Dove and Leo. Um, Marav, quickly before Dove and Leo, just can you remind everyone what to do if they have a question? Sure, thanks for that. Um, if you have questions, either chat them to me in the chat that's um, on the PowerPoint, or you can email them to me if for some reason the chat isn't working. Um, we will do our very best to answer all the questions. If for some reason your question doesn't get answered, do email it to me. I'm sure that the presenters would be more than happy um, to answer your questions. We're all really invested in you knowing everything you need to to move forward in this work. Thanks, Michael. Okay, Leo and Dove. All right. <clears throat> thank you so much, everyone, and thank you, Hafa. That was fantastic. Um, I'm here with Dove. Um, and we're just going to talk a little bit about the work that we're doing at JFridge and how that fits into this, this picture um, of Jews of color in the Jewish community. Um, the themes we're going to be talking about are um, that Jews of color are marginalized in Jewish life and experience racism inside and outside of the Jewish community. Um, by bringing Jews of color into the center of our social justice activism, uh, we get just a fantastic win-win. It, it's a, an amazing way for Jews of color to come back into the Jewish community for folks who have drifted away, have been disaffected because of um, uh, feeling discriminated against or not fitting into Jewish communal life. And it also sharpens and enhances our social justice work. Um, it makes it more powerful um, and more centered. 
it also um, creates bridges to other communities of color and helps the Jewish community better reflect our actual diversity. Um, so it's, you know, it's a really powerful way to shift our community. Um, the first step, the key to, to making this happen is leadership development. We need to invest in Jews of color so that they have the skills and political acumen that they need to step up into central roles in our institutions, in our communities. Um, Hava talked about this. Um, and we do this by making long-term commitments to future leaders um, and supporting Jews of color to have organizations and spaces and caucuses. Um, this is something that we have done at JFridge over the past few years, and we have had an incredible uh, uh, benefit. Um, the organization has transformed in a really beautiful way. I'm going to pass it to Dove now. Yeah, so um, for 25 years, JFridge has pursued racial and economic justice and working in deep partnership with organizations representing New York's marginalized communities. So we've helped win union contracts and back wages for low-income workers, passed groundbreaking legislation protecting domestic workers, secured legislative support for police reform. In over 25 years, we've really grown into one of the strongest and most effective Jewish social justice organizations in the country. And we've done this really by building a, a robust and vibrant Jewish community where Jews of all ages find connection, ritual, home, really long-lasting relationships. Um, but as successful as JPRIDGE has been for the first 20 years, uh, there was a clear gap in our community. Uh, we were almost entirely white. Um, and yet, as Hava talked about, Jewish people of color make up anywhere from 6% to 20% of the Jewish community, depending on who's counting. You know, as she noted, black Jews, Latina Jews, Asian Jews, Arab Jews, biracial Jews, Jews from every part of the world um, living here in the U.S., but a lot of Jews of color aren't counted in demographic data because they've been alienated from Jewish communities, you know, like Hava was talking about, because of racism, because not being considered Jewish by the community are simply not seeing themselves reflected in the leadership of our communities. Um, and of course, outside of the Jewish community, Jews of color also face the same racial barriers and struggles that all people of color in America face. So we came to understand that Jews of color were also alienated from our organization, and yet we're an organization committed to racial justice. So clearly there was a problem. Um, what this meant was that people in our Jewish community most targeted by racism were absent. You know, the voices that needed to be heard most when talking about racial justice weren't actually there at all. So starting three years ago, we began devoting significant resources to building the leadership of Jews of color here. And the impact of this effort has been much more powerful than we could have imagined when we started. Um, our work and our community has been transformed, and we have a very different, very exciting vision for the future of Jewish social justice as a result of our investment in Jews of color. So, you know, big picture. What would be different five years from now if the leadership of Jews of color was fully supported by the Jewish funding community? Well, we think we would have an energized, dynamic, multiracial Jewish community throughout the country that would attract Jews of all ages to participate. Uh, we would find uh, the Jewish community would have deeper, richer relationships with communities of color, be more deeply understood by our allies and other communities. We would have a creative, dynamic Jewish social justice movement that fully reflects our Jewish values. Um, and that Jews of color would find home and community that supports and celebrates them. So that's kind of the vision that of the Jewish community that we and the Jewish Multiracial Network and Ben the Ark are working towards. And uh, we want more leaders in the Jewish community to be part of that vision. Um, and a key to that vision is investing in and developing the leadership of Jews of color, as well as investing in a Jewish social justice work with a focus on racial justice. So um, thanks, Doug. That was fantastic. So I think the question that I want to talk about is, you know, what values should drive our efforts to support Jews of color? Um, so like what I have seen uh, building our, our caucus of uh, Jews of color at JFridge is that in order for us to thrive in Jewish institutions, we, it's not enough for us to just be included. Our voices need to be centered um, and ultimately we need to be at the table when decisions are made. 
Um, that requires a real investment of resources and time. It can't be rushed. It's something that has to be done thoughtfully. Um, at JFridge, we spend a lot of effort developing the leadership of all of our members. Uh, and once we started building our caucus and, and thinking about centering the voices of Jews of color, um, we made sense uh, certain that we really prioritized the, the participation of Jews of color through regular one-on-one -on -one meetings, setting goals and work planning and doing political education um, on topics like campaign development and fundraising and anti-Semitism and anti-racism, we help our members grow into powerful community leaders. Um, our flagship leadership development program that um, uh, Doug mentioned and I think uh, Michael mentioned is the Grace Paley Organizing Fellowship, which is um, about to start uh, its next cohort. It's uh, an eight-month uh, community organizer training program that builds skills and analysis for JFridge member leaders. Um, it's really an extraordinary uh, program. Uh, and starting this year, I'm really proud and excited to say, our cohort is made up entirely of Jews of color, Mizrahi and Sephardi Jews, and poor and working class Jews, which is all part of JFridge's efforts to um, build the leadership of these communities that have been marginalized often within the Jewish community. So very excited about that. Um, Similarly, I was also proud to be part of uh, Ben the Ark Sela program, um, which this year uh, was entirely composed of Jews of color and provided you know, this uh, wonderful, extraordinary group of growing leaders from around the country, including Hava, um, the, the chance of, uh, for, for in-depth leadership development. It was really wonderful. Um, as you can imagine, doing this kind of sustained leadership development is challenging. Um, it takes a lot of effort, it takes a lot of resource, but it is central, vital, if we want to shift our community in a thoughtful way. All too often, you know, what, what I have seen again and again over the years is that um, Jews of color are either ignored, right, erased, we don't think of them as being part of our community, or we thrust them into responsibilities that uh, they aren't ready for because of, you know, well-intentioned but possibly misguided urgency on the part of an institution that wants to have diversity. And neither one of these extremes serves us well. The only way to change this dynamic is to continually invest in creating the leadership, uh, the leadership pipelines that Jews of color um, need by helping folks over the long term to become the powerful leaders we know that we are. So, um, so at JFridge, I'm very proud to say that over the past uh, two years, our JOC membership has grown to include, from zero, <laughs> uh, has grown to include uh, 50 active members um, taking on leadership um, and working hard um, in our organization, leading campaigns and programs and planning actions, um, investing in our community and leading in ever more powerful, visible, central ways. It's really been amazing. Um, uh, however, the other really important point that I want to make here is that um, leadership development isn't always enough. Jews of color have often had so many experiences of racism, of alienation, um, of erasure within Jewish institutions and Jewish community that it can require a lot of patience and thoughtfulness and attention to create the safe spaces like caucuses that we need to get Jews of color to feel at home in Jewish life, but also that at JFridge, our social justice activism was actually the key difference in creating a pathway back into Jewish community for many Jews of color, not all, but for a significant group. Um, we know from the Pew study um, that 56% of Jews consider social justice to be central to their Jewish identity, which is part of why JFridge has thrived uh, and been such an amazing growing uh, organization. But for Jews of color, certainly for myself, social justice and racial justice carry you know, an, an even deeper and sort of more intimate weight. Um, for us, uh, you know, or I, again, speaking for myself, but I think I speak, I think I can safely say that this represents a lot of folks in our community. Fighting for racial justice isn't, you know, an abstract issue. It's how we fight for our civil rights. Um, it's how we assert our own place in Jewish community. And it's how we make certain that our families and neighbors, uh, you know, the, the people of color in our community who may or may not be Jewish are loved and valued in the larger society. Um, 
So a multiracial community of Jews working day in and day out to fight racism and other forms of oppression is just an incredibly powerful antidote. It's an amazing image to see as a Jew of color. Um, it, um, you know, for folks who have faced racism in Jewish institutions as young people, coming into a space like the one that Jake Fridge is creating um, is an incredible way back into the Jewish community. Um, this dynamic, I think, was really on display, this incredibly hopeful picture of, of Jewish social justice was on display during our um, Jews for Black Lives Month of Action this summer in which our Jews of Color Caucus led our entire community in powerful weekly actions in the streets of New York um, for a full month. It was, the, I think, easily the largest Jewish racial justice mobilization in recent memory. Hundreds of people uh, came out in the streets with Jews of Color leading them in songs and chants and ritual. It was just incredibly moving, and it looked you know, really remarkably different from what we normally think of when we picture the Jewish community. This was you know, a multiracial community in action, fully invested in loving and supporting one another and deeply committed to justice, um, something really, really special and powerful. Um, as I mentioned earlier, our Jews of Color Caucus has grown really rapidly um, at each step of the way. Our thinking has evolved, and in many ways, I think what's sort of amazing to me, having been there at the beginning, is realizing actually just how much we underestimated the potential and scope of what we were doing when we started. Um, I think what we've all come to realize um, at JFridge is that when the voices and leadership of Jews of color become central in Jewish community, the community blossoms. Um, you know, we're, we're continuing in this you know, amazing shift now that's been evolving since we started doing this work um, that is, as far as we know, unique within the Jewish landscape, a multiracial, multiethnic, multigenerational, cross-class community dedicated to fighting for racial and economic justice and organized around the leadership, vision, and guidance of Jews of color and others who are directly targeted by oppression. Um, and I'll sort of finish out my portion and pass it back to Doug just by saying that when you know we organized the, um, the Jews of color national convening along with the Jewish Multiracial Network and Ben the Ark in May, um, you know, we wanted to give Jews of color the tools they needed to build and shape their own communities to take their place as leaders within Jewish life. And I just have you know, one of many, many, many amazing quotes and uh, bits of feedback that we got from people who participated in this really unprecedented um, convening. Um, one person said, I am here because I needed this space more than I knew I needed this because I am refusing to leave pieces of me at the door of Jewish spaces. That, that is the voice of a future leader in our community. So, um, so I'm just going to finish up um, by um, you know, talking about that the, the growth in the leadership of Jews of color at JFridge has actually shifted the whole organization in some transformative ways. Um, white Jews, especially those in their 20s and 30s, don't want to be in all white spaces. You know, in a city like New York, it doesn't reflect their experiences anywhere else, and it keeps people turned off from Jewish life. So now young Jews coming to JFridge events can expect to join a multiracial community that looks more like the communities they have outside of the Jewish community. And our discussions in political education are deeply enriched by multiple viewpoints and experiences, and our, our vision has really expanded. Um, Additionally, our partnerships with other non-Jewish social justice organizations are deepening as they learn more about the diversity of the Jewish community. Um, there's palpable excitement from these non-Jewish organizations to build relationships with our Jews of color members. And as part of those deepening relationships, they've, uh, we've started piloting trainings for them on anti-Semitism, uh, trainings that our Jews of color leaders are, are giving. And the response we've gotten from the staff of these organizations has been overwhelmingly positive. Um, you know, as I mentioned a moment ago, JFRIDGE has been growing um, over the past few years especially, and we have no doubt that expanding the leadership of Jews of color is part of that growth. Um, you know, in the last year alone, we've doubled our membership, as particularly among Jews in their 20s and 30s, to over 1,800 members. 
Um, and, you know, the, the summer street actions that Leo talked about brought between 100 and 400 young Jews out each time. Um, and this is definitely part of the shifting leadership that's energizing the whole community. Um, and, you know, to close, this is really where funders can play such an important role in the work throughout the field. You know, we know that this growth wouldn't have happened on its own by volunteers only. It takes institutional support. You know, our Grace Paley Organizing Fellowship, our community organizers on staff, you know, these are the programs and the staff that make transitions like this possible and that lead to this exuberant and engaged community. So we need investment in our leadership development program to support emerging young leaders. We need investment of Jews of color on staff, investment in community engagement for Jews of color to find supportive pathways into organizations. We need to support our leaders that are currently opening doors for Jews of color to enter Jewish organizational life. Um, and we need support for a network of organizations to do this together. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Um, so great, we have a chance now to open it up for questions. And Marab, yeah. have you received questions? Yes, I have. Um, so we'll start. If anybody else wants to ask more questions, again, email or chat. Um, the first question we have here is, in addition to funding and supporting leaders, thereby making Jews of color more visible, do you have a sense of what individual Jews of color need or want? Are we only talking about institutional or programmatic contexts? What percentage of Jews of color are affi affiliated? Um, and how can we think about Jews of color or and Jews in general in new or non-institutional contexts? That's a pretty big question. So that that came in as one question. That came in as one question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the second part was about what percentage of Jews of color are affiliated. The mm -hmm. third part was. Um, about uh, a activism in non-institutional settings? Mm -hmm. and, and I think if we could cover within the context of Jews of color, affiliated, not affiliated, and beyond, um, also Jews of color in the Orthodox community, what, is that, what does that look like? So let's, let's try and tackle that, for starters, those two pieces. And those Dove, are great. Chava, and Leo. Chava to jump on. Um. Oh. Okay, so... Um, I'll, there aren't great uh, statistics on the percentage of folks that are um, affiliated versus non-affiliated. However, what I will say is that Jews of color tend to be less affiliated with Jewish institutions and organizations because of their experiences with, of racism and isolation. So. Um, people are less likely to be engaged um, in synagogue life because they've had negative experiences either growing up or as an adult in uh, a synagogue space. Um, so what people are looking for with regard to, um, as, as individuals. So we address folks both as a, our organization addresses folks both, you know, kind of as a collective and then as, you know, kind of individuals and groupings, what are they looking for? One is welcoming synagogues. People do want to be affiliated, um, but they're nervous and scared that they won't be because they haven't been in so many different areas. And so one thing that we provide is um, a list of welcoming synagogues um, that people can look to that are in different communities that have been recommended um, by folks, uh, by members of our organization. Um, so people are looking for um, welcoming uh, synagogues. They are looking for um, diverse Jewish books. They don't want to, uh, you know, parents reach out to us all the time um, and they want to write this publisher or that publisher or, or um, really focus on getting more diverse Jewish books so that they aren't, um, the books that they read their children and the way that they instill Jewishness is not, um, their, their children's images aren't absent. Um, People want um, rabbis and congregational leaders, uh, leadership who are um, sensitized into questions that they should or should not be asking um, and creating an environment where uh, 
people feel included, um, and also ways in which they can uh, integrate various cultural traditions into a ritual. Um, they are looking for, um, you know, uh, ways in which to express Judaism um, and cultural identity in a cohesive way. Um, I think that individuals are looking for ways in which they can bring their racial and, cult and ethnic identity into Jewish spaces and not feel um, discriminated against or excluded because of that. Um, and, and yeah, and I would just jump in and add quickly that um, I think, you know, just I think one key point is just that when we invest in um, the leadership of Jews of color, you know, we, we, we build visibility, that's true, but we also change institutions. I mean, I think one of the key things is that, um, it's certainly true at Jayfridge, is that our, our organizations, our institutions actually need to change in order to bring Jews of color in and to make their, our institutions make sense for Jews of color. And by having Jews of color in leadership and by centering their voices, um, we create um, pathways for that change to occur because it won't occur without our voices in the conversation. Exactly. And I think that also, um, just to add that, um, and part of what we do as an organization is there are people who are, have been scared off um, by affiliation um, with uh, Jewish institutions. So we kind of meet them where they are, and we are very um, sensitive to having uh, programming that is, um, you know, DC, but maybe in a park or a museum or a bar for a happy hour for adults, um, you know, and kind of making sure that we are meeting people where they are, but finding opportunities to bring them closer. Um, and I think that part of that is, you know, in helping build, um, as Leo said, institutional that is going to create the, the spaces. Because even if, you know, there's not a Jewish leader of color at the synagogue, you know, there is a way to create an environment where Jewish, um, Jews of color and multiracial Jewish families can walk in the door and feel like they would be welcome. And with regard to the Orthodox community, could you provide a little more color? I'm sorry, what you got cut off that last word. Um, a little, uh, what particularly about the Orthodox community? So, so I guess the, qu the question was in response, was a question after I asked the first question of, um, do you have a sense of what individual Jews of color need or want, and who are the Jews of color um, in the Orthodox community? Is that, a, is that a big piece of the population, I guess, out of curiosity uh, to that point? Um, can the person who asked that question maybe send me some more elaboration on that so we can get the answer? I do have one more question um, following your response. Um, when you're talking about Jews of color, um, what, what it says, what do the speakers think about the term Jews of color and how does that affect your work? Like what is encompassed within that term? That's a great, great question. I think, um, so there's a couple of pieces. I mean, one is, um, I've actually been, you know, I go back and forth between saying Jews of color and saying Jewish people of color just because I think one key point is just to kind of make sure that people understand that we are Jewish, absolutely, um, and also that we are people of color in the context of, um, all, you know, our larger communities of color all throughout America and the world um, with all that comes with that. So that's, you know, one, that's one key thing. I think another important point is that um, just like the term people of color, um, Jews of color, um, is in some ways sort of a made-up identity. We are, in fact, many, many, many identities within that. We are, as Dove said, you know, um, black Jews, Chinese American Jews, Mexican American Jews, um, Jews from the Middle East, uh, 
you know, Jews from all over the world, multiracial, mixed race families, people who have been um, uh, Jewish for generations, and folks who have, you know, converted um, recently. So it's it's a really, um, you know, it's a I think that I think the thing to understand is that it is a term to organize around. Um, it it allows us to um, to build community, to build strength, um, and to um, you know come show up as a united front within our within our communities, while also hopefully retaining all the things that make us special and diverse and unique. I have a question with that in mind, as a, by way of follow up. Mm -hmm. um, so the person who asked the question uh, wrote back to me and said that she was asking more about how labeling Jews of color by color makes whites into an unmarked category and how does that shape the conversation. Um, so I'm wondering if you can make a comment on that. And then um, regarding Jews of color in the Orthodox community, um, the response from our participant is, the conversation to date seems to have been about liberal Jews. So she's curious if, um, are there special issues around Jews in the Orthodox community or not, if you know. Yeah, maybe I'll take the response about um, whiteness and, and white Jews. We've actually found that by, you know, this work that's really focused on um, uh, growing the, the numbers and leadership of, of Jews of color here that, that it actually, instead of making white into an unmarked category, it, it, it actually really makes it into a, a marked and visible category. Um, that suddenly there's um, much more conversation about what does it mean to be white Jews. And so we think about that in, in that very complex way. What does it mean to be Jews means one thing in the US, and what does it mean to be white means something else in the US. So how are we thinking about living both of those identities every day? And so um, really this work has opened up in the last two years a lot more space for white Jews to be able to be thinking in really complex ways about that identity, how it's changed um, over generations, and what it means for us today. So rather than unmarked, um, it's really been clarifying and opening for more intense discussion and, and exploration. Thank you so much, Dove. And I know we're out of time, but if we can just answer that last question about Jews of color in the Orthodox space. Sure. This is Hava. I'll, I'll take that. Um, I'm actually Orthodox and as such uh, engage a lot with the Orthodox community and have done a lot to bring um, a lot of folks in the Orthodox community into our organization. And I will say that the issues are similar, the dynamics are different. I think in the liberal Jewish world, there's a lot more institutional structure that allows for, um, allows for models of change um, to impact um, more broadly. I think that um, in the Orthodox community there is also um, issues of um, racism that people uh, face in synagogue, in shuls, in yeshivot, um, in kosher restaurants, in, uh, from clothing stores, etc. And I think that um, the conversation about change is a little bit different. Um, a lot of it needs to um, be addressed. Um, I think that there needs to be a lot more engagement um, uh, in the, the rabbinic realm, in administration, um, in the Orthodox Yeshivot, um, uh, bringing uh, tradition and um, understanding how difference, you know, is not um, anti halacha, is in and in, and. In, in, in conversations about minhag versus incorporating folk cultural traditions, um, there do need to be resources and conversations that are held um, in Orthodox spaces. I think it's really important. I know, unfortunately, way too many um, from Jews of color who are no longer affiliated because of their experiences, um, particularly in um, 
the Jewish school realm, and I think that there's a lot of work that can be done um, with educating um, rabbis and with educating school administration um, in, in the Orthodox world. I think that those would have the huge, huge levels of impact, and so those are um, conversations that we're looking to start in. Hello? Baba? Hello? Baba? Yes. Okay, sorry. Lost you for a second there. Uh-huh. Um, okay, thank you so much, um, all of our wonderful speakers. Um, Dove and Leo and Chava, you have been phenomenal. I know I've learned so much. I'm getting feedback already that um, the folks on the call have learned so much. Everyone stayed on, even though we, we ran a couple minutes over. Um, thank you, Michael, for moderating and for, for being a part of this process. We could not have done it without um, your support. So um, I'm going to close Mar- the call Rob, now. Those who, have, um, those who have additional questions or want to get in touch with any of the speakers, how do they do that? Definitely get in touch with me. Shoot me an email, and I'll forward those questions along. Mm-hmm. State your email um, address. Yeah. My email address is marav at jfunders.org. I've been sending you all the info on how to, how to get um, onto this call, so hopefully you'll be able to, uh, to find me. Um, and, um, and I'll speak to the speakers as well. If they're comfortable with me sharing out the email addresses by, when I follow up, I can do that as well. Absolutely. One of the photos seemingly had a group of people floating in midair at the beach. I want to learn how to do that. <laughs> I, we can teach we, you that trick. We can show you that, yeah. First, you have to organize a large group of Jews of color, and then, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go from there. Awesome. So that can be our next, the, the follow-up from this, is learning how to float on air um, <laughs> as a team. So thank you guys so much for everything. Um, Michael, if you have any closing words, feel free. Uh, adelante. Because <laughs> it's, it's after one. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. So everyone take care. Have a great day and a great week, and uh, we'll all speak soon. Bye-bye. Thank you all so much. Thanks, everyone.